If you have your Bibles this morning, would you turn with me to Matthew's Gospel in the 16th chapter? And I'd like to read verses 24 to 26. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give? in exchange for his soul. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And that's where I'd like for us to be this, this morning as we invite the Lord to uh, illumine our hearts. Heavenly Father, through your spirit, amplify, Lord, for us the words of your Son, so that we may understand and even beyond understanding, appropriate, and after appropriating, Lord, apply it in our lives, and to that end, Lord, that each one of us will be in your beautiful presence, following hard after you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I think one of the first things to do when we look at a passage like this is to establish who, establish who we are in relationship to what the Bible is saying. Jesus is addressing this to his disciples and he's saying, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And I think it would be wise for us to first let's kind of um, understand where we are in this whole concept of um, who God is as creator, who we are as his creation, and whether we would fall into this category of disciples. Because if it doesn't, or if we don't, then it has no bearing on any of us. It's just words here. So I think as we look at establishing this relationship, we need to acknowledge uh, four things, and this is not an exhaustive list, but four things I believe that we need to say, this is true for me. And the first one is this, that we acknowledge that God is creator God. That God is the one who created. That he is the one who spoke this world into existence. That he is the one who flung those stars into space and created this beautiful canopy over us. That he is the one who drew, drew a line and said only that far can you come before land starts. That he is the one who placed all this vegetation, these beautiful trees, the flowers, all the things that add such beauty to the world, that he did it, that he is the one who put fish in the water and birds in the air and such beautiful uh, animals on the ground. We must acknowledge that he is creator God, first. Second, we need to acknowledge that we are his creation. That he made us, he formed us. The Bible tells us that we are fearfully and wonderful made, wonderfully made, that we are the clay and that he is the potter. And so we need to understand that in relationship to the creator, God, this magnificent creator, we are his creation. Thirdly, that he has a purpose for his creation that he didn't just form us and then plonk us down on the earth and say, okay, go and have some fun. But he has a purpose 
for each one of us and we find that purpose in Genesis chapter 1 26 to 28 God says let us make mankind in our own image in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea the birds in the sky over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground so God created mankind in his own image in the image of God he created them male and female he created them God blessed them and said to them be fruitful and increase in number fill the earth and subdue it rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground God created us with a purpose he created us to be stewards to be to manage his creation in fact that's the understanding of the Hebrew word mashal for manager it's one who takes authority from God and then oversees God's creation and that's the purpose that we have that God had for us and then fourthly we need to ask that even as we look at what we could dismiss as as a purpose at a very macro level yeah I don't really engage with that what does it mean for you and me as we look at this purpose for his creation how does it touch you how does it touch me what do I need to do to fulfill this purpose that God has given to me and so I need to ask the question how do I manage the resources that are around me how do I reflect his glory how am I fruitful how do I keep his will how do I fulfill my reason mine for being here at this time in this place in this era amidst all the situations and circumstances that we are facing right now why now what does God have in store for me and so those are the four areas that I believe we should first look at as we begin to look at what it means to be a disciple but we know isn't it that it didn't stay in this pristine condition the fall happened and we lost it we gave allegiance to Satan and then it took the incarnation of Jesus to, to begin that restoration work to draw us back to a loving and holy God and he did that by paying the penalty for our sins because God had said the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord and so he paid the price for us and in restored to us beloved that relationship that we have with God and in restoring that relationship he gave us back purpose and in giving us back purpose he called us to be his disciples and so today we are able to acknowledge all of the above and if we have bought into the sacrifice that Jesus made then this passage is front and center for you and me we are called to be his disciples Jesus said to his disciples if anyone wishes to follow after me he must deny himself so beloved we are followers of Jesus we are followers of God you remember Elijah standing in front of the children of Israel and the priests of Baal and his clarion call to them was if the Lord is God follow him if the Lord is God follow him and if Baal is God then follow Baal but let's not vacillate between two opinions it was clear crystal clear if the Lord is God follow him remember Bartimaeus isn't it Bible tells us that Bartimaeus was sitting by the side of the road in the Greek it is para ten hodon 
sitting by the side of the road. And then he had this encounter with Jesus. And verse 52 of that 10th chapter ends by saying that he got up and began to follow him on the road. Ente hodon. In the way or in the road. Following him on the road. Beloved, that is the call of disciples even today. The call to discipleship is not static. The call to discipleship is dynamic. We're not called to be spectators, to watch this Christian parade go by or to just sing a few songs, enjoy ourselves. We're called to be dynamic followers <clears throat> of God. Ongoing, step by step by step, we move after him. Not sitting down and watching something happen. And we know that there's plenty, isn't it, that we can sit and watch today. So much. The internet is full of things. The call for us is to be followers of Jesus. To dynamically follow him. And then Jesus says, if you want to be my disciples, if you want to follow me, there are two things that you need to be aware that you will have to deny yourself and you will have to take up your cross. You will have to deny yourself. There'll be times when you deny yourself and then there'll be times when you take up the cross. Let's look at it. What would he want? <clears throat> what would he want us to? <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> what would he want us to deny as we look at ourselves? The original term is to lay something down. To put something down intentionally. What would be things that you and I need to put down? Well, let me give you four or maybe five areas in our lives that I think could be areas that we need to be very careful. They may be areas of great strength and success, but they could lead to a place where we need to deny them. For example, our abilities. Our abilities. We're all gifted in different ways to be able to do something and do it well. And yet, that in that doing it well, we can get to a point where we abuse it. Take leadership, for example. We can be a good leader, and then you can get into a place where there's exploitation. Exploitation of the underprivileged, exploitation of the poor, the uneducated. Leadership can also get to a place where there is abuse. And the purposes of God are not being fulfilled. And so we get into that space where we need to deny ourselves and the things that are happening because leadership is an abuse. And so it could be any ability that you have that you do well. That if it moves to a point where it is not being used in the will of God, that's something that needs to be denied or take for example service and you would say service how can how can that be well it's possible isn't it that we serve people we do everything as unto the lord that's the call that it's offered as a sacrifice to god we do our best and yet it's possible beloved that even in service to god that we can begin to be proud of the things that we do and slowly <clears throat> get to a place where we usurp the glory that must be God's. <clears throat> we usurp, we take the glory 
that should be his because through our service people see us and they don't see god twice in isaiah we are reminded by god my glory i will not share with another and we need to be so very careful that we are in no at no time do we take god's place in the things that we do and then look at our emotions emotions the love <clears throat> take love for example i'm so sorry i don't know what's <clears throat> take love for example we can operate out of love but at some point if we let love get to a place where it is abused it becomes lust isn't it at the other end of the spectrum and so we need to be sure that it never gets there that love never gets into an abusive place a place where we take advantage and so we need to deny that emotion in ourselves and move back to a loving relationship or take anger the bible tells us be angry but do not sin isn't it be angry anger is an emotion it's an emotion how do we not sin make sure that the behavior that is attached to the emotion is not a sinful behavior emotion the anger that we have that god has placed within us the ability to be angry is like the spout on a pressure cooker it releases but we need to make sure that when that is released it doesn't harm the behavior doesn't harm also look at the talents that god has given us maybe you are a gifted singer actor orator athlete sports person whatever how do you handle it how do you handle success and fame fame do you handle it with pride or do you handle it with humility just your office spaces when the adulation comes that you've done a good job how do you handle it and all of these things <clears throat> jesus is saying you need to be careful you need to be careful that you have to deny these things lastly let me throw in personality as well you may ask how does personality need to be denied well you broadly look at personality and see that we may come down as introverts and extroverts and extroverts would be outgoing introverts would be not outgoing and the difference between them both as you know only rest Would you pray for me? Just pray for me. <clears throat> Thank you. And when we look at introverts and extroverts, outgoing not god going the the difference is where we get our energy from extroverts get it from people introverts get it from solitude like being alone and yet beloved we can see that if you an outgoing person more used to being in the social realm and you enjoy it there can be times when you can get overbearing or if you're an introvert there can be times where there's passive aggressive attitudes that come to the fore when i do uh, premarital counseling for the ones who are going to get married i do a personality test with them it's always interesting because the one that i do has strengths and weaknesses 
and to see that your strengths, the other end of the spectrum can turn into a weakness. And so to be constantly aware that you're never not dealing in weak areas. And so when you find that, then to be able to deny yourself. Okay, so I just throw out those and then move on to what does it mean to take up your cross? What does it mean to take up your cross? Jesus here is not talking so much about his death as he's talking about what it means, what the cross means. The cross was a very well-known area of punishment during that time. Let me just read what John MacArthur has done a lot of research in this area says about it. He says, the cross was a very concrete and vivid reality. It was the instrument of execution reserved for Rome's worst enemies. It was a symbol of the torture and death that awaited those who dared raise a hand against Roman authority. Not many years before Jesus and the disciples came to Caesarea and Philippi, 100 men had been crucified in the area. And then he goes on to say that there were 800 Jewish rebels who were crucified at Jerusalem. And then during uh, proconsul Varus, 2,000 Jews were killed and ends by saying that something like 30,000 crucifixions occurred under Roman authority during the lifetime of Christ, okay? So that's the backdrop to understanding what it means to take up your cross. And so Jesus is saying that there are some things that need to be crucified. Picking up your cross is to put to death something. Something needs to be crucified in our lives. And so we need to ask the question, what exactly needs to be crucified in my life? What needs to die in my life? The cross is more than suffering. It's about death. It's putting to death and making something final. So let's look at a couple of things that we see in the Bible. The Bible talks about our thoughts, isn't it? That our thoughts can go on a rampage and we can think things that we ought not to be thinking about. And yet, Paul says in Philippians, take every thought captive. Take every thought captive and look at it and say, is this worthy of my time? As a disciple of Jesus, is this a good thought? And if it's not, then kill it. Dismiss it. Don't dwell upon it. It's, he says, take every thought captive. In other words, don't be gentle with these things. And to crucify is an aggressive word. And he says that's how you ought to be dealing with the thoughts that come to your head. Nail them and say, you have no business. And I dismiss you from my mind. <clears throat> and then when you think about sin and the old habits that keep coming back, to recognize that we are a new creation. The old has passed, behold, new things have come. And to crucify those old things, recognize that this is not part of my disciple walk, and to say, I will not go into this area. In fact, Paul says in Galatians, he talks about impure thoughts, eagerness for lustful pleasure, idolatry, spiritism, hatred and fighting, jealousy and anger, constant effort to get the best for yourself, complaints and criticisms, feeling that everyone else is wrong except those in your own group, wrong doctrine, envy, murder, <clears throat> drunkenness, wild parties, and things like that. All things that we may indulge in, which we need to crucify. They need to be nailed to a cross so that they don't come back to us. But here's the thing, following Jesus' instructions can be painful, it can be inconvenient, it can be unpopular, and yet that is par for the course, beloved. Jesus at no point told us that it will be easy. In fact, if you re remember in Matthew 8, 19 and 20, one of the scribes came to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, 
Foxes have dens and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. Think carefully before you say that you will follow me. Also, he never lowered the standard. You remember the rich young ruler who came to him, asked, what must I do to get eternal life? Jesus said, you know, keep the commandments, love, all of that. He said, all that I've done. Jesus then said, sell all that you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And the man turned and went. The Bible says very clearly that Jesus loved him. But Jesus didn't stop him from going. He loved him, but didn't stop him from turning around and walking away. How do we hold on to the things that we have? If God were to say, leave it and walk away, would you do so? That's the litmus test. Not how much you have. It's how you hold on to the things that you have. Tomorrow, if God was to say, I want you to leave it, I want you to give this away, would you be able to do it? But in the midst of that, there's also failure. Failure as we walk the path of discipleship. And we understood, Peter understood that very well, isn't it? But beloved, the path to restoration after remorse and repentance and all of that is just one question that Jesus repeated three times. And that one question was, do you love me? Do you love me? It seems to be at the heart of being a disciple of Jesus. Do we have a love relationship with him? Do we love him dearly? If he were to ask us today, do you love me, what would our answer be? Do you love me? I'm not interested in the things that you do for me. Just tell me, do you love me? I always point this out in that passage Doing things for Jesus came after this question was answered. Doing things came after this question was answered. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my sheep. After yes, feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, shepherd my flock. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, feed my lambs. Always after the love question has been answered. So, beloved, I... I think as we look at our own lives today and the call to be a true disciple of his, to realize that being a disciple is not convenient. It's not convenient. It wasn't convenient for Jesus, isn't it? The incarnation was not convenient. It was difficult. As the songwriter says, he left the splendor of heaven. He did. But it's a call that he makes on each one of us. On each one of us sitting here. If you name Jesus as Savior and Lord, you're his disciple. And the call then is to deny yourself, pick up your cross and follow him. Follow. And so the question for us today is, is there anything that we need to deny of ourselves today? Anything that we need to deny? What do we need to put to death in our lives that continues to plague us? How closely are we holding on to the things that he has given us? Would we be ready to let go? Are we learning from him every day as a disciple ought to learn of the master? Are we being obedient to him? And then are we emulating him? 
Do people see Jesus in us? There was an old chorus that, that said, when the morning breaks and when I awake, this my plea will be, Lord, today I would ask of thee, more like Jesus that I would be. Then I'd be like Jesus only by his grace, more and more like Jesus till I see him face to face. If any man would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross and follow me. I don't know where you are, beloved, this morning. Could be that you've lost your way. But you started off as a disciple with zeal and fervor, and somewhere along the way, it got too difficult, or love just grew cold. And yet, the good news for me always is that we come to the foot of the cross, to the table of mercy and grace. Here, forgiveness is offered, cleansing is done, U-turns are allowed, confessions are received. So let's prepare our hearts to come to the table and come as the Holy Spirit directs each one of us to come.